this word observer, it, it means something in quantum mechanics. It means something in a lot of places. It means something to us humans right. as conscious beings. So what what's the importance of the observer? What is the observer and what's the importance of the observer in the computational universe? So this question of what is an observer, what's the general idea of an observer, is actually one of my next projects, which got somewhat derailed by the, the current sort of AI mania. But um, Is there a connection there, or is that, uh, do you do you think the observer is primarily a physics phenomena? Is it related to the whole AI thing? Yes. Yes, it is related. Okay. So one question is, what is a general observer? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know, we have an idea what is a general computational system. We think about Turing machines, we think about other models of computation. There's a question, what is a general model of an observer? And the, there's kind of observers like us, which is kind of the observers we're interested in. Yeah. You know, we could imagine an alien observer that deals with computational irreducibility and it has a mind that's utterly different from ours and, and completely incoherent with what, what we're like. But the fact is that, that you know, if we are talking about observers like us, the, one of the key things is this idea of kind of taking all the detail of the world and being able to stuff it into a mind, mm -hmm. being able to take all the detail and kind of you know, extract out of it a smaller set of, of kind of degrees of freedom, a smaller number of, of elements that will sort of fit in our minds. And I think... This, this question, so I've been interested in trying to characterize what is the general observer. And the general observer is, I think, in part, there are many, let, let me give an example of a, mm -hmm. you know, you have a gas, it's got a bunch of molecules bouncing around, and the thing you're measuring about the gas is its pressure. Mm -hmm. And the only thing you as an observer care about is pressure. And that means you have a piston on the side of this box, and the piston is being pushed by the gas. And there are many, many different ways that molecules can hit that piston. Mm. But all that matters is the kind of aggregate of all those molecular impacts, because that's what determines pressure. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge number of different configurations of the gas, which are all equivalent. So I think one key aspect of observers is this equivalencing of many different configurations of a system, saying all I care about is this aggregate feature, all I care about is this, this overall thing. And that's, that's sort of one, one aspect. And we see that in lots of different, again, it's the same story over and over again, that there's, there's a lot of detail in the world, but what we are extracting from it is something, a sort of a thin, uh, a thin summary of that, of that detail. Is that thin summary nevertheless true is can it be a, a crappy approximation sure that on average is is correct i mean if we look at the observer that's the human mind it seems like there's a lot of very um as represented by natural language for example there's a lot of really crappy approximation sure and that could be maybe a feature of it well but there's yes, ambiguity but, right right you don't know you know, it could be the case. You're just measuring the aggregate impacts of these molecules, but there is some tiny, tiny probability that these molecules will arrange themselves in some really funky way, and that just measuring that average isn't going to be the main point. Yeah. By the way, an awful lot of science is very confused about this because you know you look at you look at papers and people are really keen. They draw this curve and they have these you know these bars on the curve and things. Yeah. And it's just this curve, and it's this one thing. And it's supposed to represent some system that has all kinds of details in it. And this is a way that lots of science has gotten wrong. Because people say, I remember years ago, I was studying snowflake growth. The, you, know, <laughs> you have a snowflake and it's growing, it has all these arms, it's doing complicated things. But there was a literature on this stuff and it talked about, you know, what's the rate of snowflake growth? And, you know, it, it got pretty good answers for the rate of the growth of the snowflake. And they looked at it more carefully, and, and they had these nice curves of, you know, snowflake growth rates and so on. I looked at it more carefully, and I realized, according to their models, the snowflake will be spherical. Mm -hmm. And so they got the growth rate right, but the detail was just utterly wrong. And, you know, the, not only the detail, the, the whole thing was, was not capturing, you know, it was capturing this aspect of the system that was, in a sense, missing the main point of what was going on. And what is the geometric uh, shape of a snowflake? Snowflakes start in, in the phase of water that's relevant yeah. to the formation of snowflakes. It's a phase of ice which starts with a hexagonal arrangement of, of water molecules. Mm -hmm. And so it starts off growing as a hexagonal plate. And then what happens is, 
It's, it's a plate. Oh, oh, versus sphere, sphere versus. Well, no, plate. no, but it's it's much more than that. I mean, snowflakes yeah. are fluffy. You know, typical snowflakes have little little dendritic arms. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and what actually happens is it's kind of kind of cool because you can make these very simple discrete models with cellular automata and things that that figure this out. You start off with this you know hexagonal thing, and then the places it it starts to grow little arms, and every time a little piece of ice it adds itself to the snowflake. Mm -hmm. The fact that that ice condensed from the water vapor m heats the snowflake up locally, and so it makes it less likely for uh, for another piece of ice to accumulate right nearby. So this leads to a kind of growth inhibition. So you grow an arm, and it, it is a, a separated arm because right around the arm it got a little bit hot and it didn't add more ice there. So what happens is it grows. You have a hexagon. It grows out arms. The arms grow arms. And then the arms grow, arms grow, arms. And eventually, actually, it's kind of cool because it, it actually fills in another hexagon, a bigger hexagon. And when I first looked at this, you know, I had a very simple model for this. I realized, you know, when it fills in that hexagon, it actually leaves some holes behind. So I thought, well, you know, that, is that really right? So I look at these pictures of snowflakes, and sure enough, they have these little holes in them that are kind of scars of the way that these arms grow out. Mm -hmm. um, so you that, can't fill in backfill holes. So they don't backfill. Going yeah, they don't backfill. And, and presumably, there's a limitation on how big. Like you can't arbitrarily grow. I'm not sure. I mean, the thing falls through the. the I mean, I think it does. You know, it hits That's the right. ground at some point. Oh, I think I you see. can grow. I, th I think you can grow in the lab. I think you can grow pretty big ones. I think you can grow many, many iterations of this kind of goes from hexagon. It grows out arms. It turns back. It fills back into a hexagon. It grows more arms again. In 3D. No, it's flat usually. Why is it flat? Why doesn't it uh, span out? Okay, 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 wait a minute. You said it's fluffy, and fluffy is a three-dimensional property, no? Or no, it's it's fluffy. Snow is okay. So you know what makes we're really uh, we're really in a, I like in this. a detail. Let's go here, there. But, but uh, this um, multiple snowflakes become fluffy. A single snowflake is not fluffy. No, no, a single snowflake is fluffy. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, you know, if if you have snow that is just pure hexagons, mm -hmm. they they can, you know, they they fit together pretty well. It's not it doesn't it doesn't make it doesn't have a lot of air in it. Mm -hmm. And they can also slide against each other pretty easily. And so the snow can be pretty, you know, can I think avalanches happen sometimes when when the things tend to be these, you know, hexagonal plates and it kind of slides. But then when the thing has all these arms that have grown out, it's not, they don't fit together very well. And that's why the snow has lots of air in it. And if you look at one of these snowflakes, you know, if you catch one, you'll see it has these little arms. And people, actually people often say, you know, no two snowflakes are alike. Um, that's mostly because as a snowflake grows, they do grow pretty consistently with these different arms and so on, but you capture them at different times. As they, you know, they fell through, through the air in a different way, you'll catch this one at this stage, and as it goes through different stages, they look really different. And so that's why, you know, kind of looks like no two snowflakes are alike because you caught them at different at different times. So the rules under which they grow are the same. It's yes. just the timing is. Yes. Okay, so the point is science is not able to uh, describe the full complexity of snowflake growth. Well, science, if you if you do what people might often do, which is say, okay, let's make it scientific, let's turn it into one number. Mm -hmm. And that one number is kind of the growth rate of the arms or some such other thing. That fails to capture sort of the detail of what's going on inside the system. And that's in a sense a big challenge for science is how do you extract from the natural world, for example, those aspects of it that you are interested in talking about. Now, you yeah. might just say, I don't really care about the fluffiness of the snowflakes. All I care about is the growth rate of the arms, in which case, you know, you have you can have a good model without knowing anything about the fluffiness. Um, but the fact is, as a practical, you know, when, if you if you say what's the what is the most obvious feature of a snowflake? Oh, that it has this complicated shape. Well, then you've got a different story about what you model. I mean, this this is one of the features of of sort of modeling in science. That you know, what is a model? A model is some way of reducing the actuality of the world to something where you can readily sort of give a narrative for what's happening, where you can basically make some kind of abstraction of what's happening and answer questions that you care about answering. If you wanted to answer all possible questions about the system, you'd have to have the whole system because mm -hmm. you might care about this particular molecule. Where did it go? And you know, your model, which is some big abstraction of that, has nothing to say about that. 
So, you know, one of the things that's, that's often confusing in science is people will have, I've got a model, somebody says. Somebody else will say, I don't believe in your model because it doesn't capture the feature of the system that I care about. You know, there's always this controversy about, you know, is, the, is it a correct model? Well, no model, is a, except for the actual system itself, is a correct model in the sense that it captures everything. The question is, does it capture what you care about capturing? Sometimes that's ultimately defined by what you're going to build technology out of, things like this. The one counterexample to this is, if you think you're modeling the whole universe all the way down, then there is a notion of a correct model. But even that is more complicated because it depends on kind of how observers sample things and so on. That's a, that's a separate story. But at least at the first level, to say, you know, this thing about, oh, it's an approximation, you're capturing one aspect, you're not capturing other aspects. When you really think you have a complete model for the whole universe, you better be capturing ultimately everything even though to actually run that model is impossible because of computational irreducibility. The only, the only thing that successfully runs that model is the actual running of the universe. Is the universe itself. But okay, so what you care about is an interesting concept. So that's a, that's a human concept. So that's what you're doing with, with uh, Wolfram Alpha and Wolfram Language, is you're trying to come up with symbolic representations yes. as simple as possible. Uh, so a model that's as simple as possible that fully captures stuff we care about. Yes. So, I mean, for example, you know, we could, we'll have a, a thing about, you know, data about movies, let's say. We could be describing every individual pixel in every movie and so on, but that's not the level that people care about. And it's, yes, this is a, I mean, and, and that level that people care about is somewhat related to what's described in natural language. Mm -hmm. But what what we're trying to do is to find a way to sort of represent precisely so you can compute things. See, see one thing when you say, you give a piece of natural language, question is, you feed it to a computer. You say, does the computer understand this natural language? Well, you know, the computer processes it in some way, it does this, maybe it can make a continuation of the natural language, you know, maybe it can go on from the prompt and say what it's gonna say. You say, does it really understand it? Hard to know, but for, in this kind of computational world, there is a very definite definition of does it understand, which is, could it be turned into this symbolic computational thing from which you can compute all kinds of consequences? Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the sense in which one has sort of a target for the understanding of natural language. And that's kind of our goal is to have as much as possible about the world that can be computed in a, in a reasonable way, so to speak, be able to be sort of captured by this kind of computational language. That's that's kind of the goal. And and I think for us humans, the, the main thing that's important is as we formalize what we're talking about, it gives us a way of kind of building a structure where we can sort of build this tower of consequences of things. So if we're just saying, well, let's talk about it in natural language, it doesn't really give us some hard foundation that lets us, you know, build step by step to work something out. I mean, it's kind of like what happens in, in math. If we were just sort of vaguely talking about math, but didn't have the kind of full structure of math and all that kind of thing, we wouldn't be able to build this kind of big tower of consequences. And so, you know, in a, in a sense, what we're trying to do with the whole computational language effort is to make a formalism for describing the world that makes it possible to kind of build this, this tower of consequences.